It will be a debate with a for and against argument for reptile morphs in the hobby. This is a debate between myself and Ellie from Panofi Pythons, who actually breeds ball python morphs. But we're going for a twist here in the fact that I'm going to take the for argument for morphs in the hobby, and Ellie is actually going to take the reverse against argument for morphs in the hobby. So we swapped. We thought that swapping sides and debating this way would be one really interesting and make for a much healthier conversation. So here we have Ellie from Panofi Pythons. My first point is the fact that morphs do bring new people into the hobby. Um, the fact that I see it in shop when I see families come in, they want to look at the snakes and the auctions, and there'll be a, there'll be a normal world python there as well, but they will opt for like that banana or that that next step into like the couple of hundreds bracket um, as the first pet, and that's going into like a family home pet situation. So the morphs have a, like lured people in to getting a snake whether that whether they were previously looking at a normal or not the morph itself was what attracted them to actually purchase an animal and now they may delve deeper into the hobby because of that morph luring them in that is one of the benefits that morphs are doing for the hobby is by bringing new people in well it says um the negative against that is that we've pretty much lost the diversity of breeding different things even like big names in the hobby they just completely have gotten rid of all other species and just focused on one thing um and so long term i wonder how much of that diversity is going to remain or if we're just going to be stuck with our five basic um species that are left behind whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I guess, because if they're well established, um, coping, that yeah, all those colubrids, all those things that you can't get morphs in, just people lose interest in. So yeah, I, I think you've got two points to that. In that, the fact that how much does that matter? It depends how much you truly believe in the in the invisible art concepts and how much you truly believe the hobby is doing the conservation if you believe it does if you believe it does absolutely nothing to conservation and we're just purely keeping pets then arguably if morphs are creating this dynamic where people are focusing on fewer species well actually that means that these few species that they are focusing on actually have a much wider captive genetic pool because of the allure of morphs and the incentive that has created to get more wild caught stock in. They necessarily, a species like Python Regis isn't suffering from founder's effect in the same way things like false water cobras or San Francisco garters in the UK or indigo snakes in the UK are because of how many have come in. Of course, I think there's going to be those few inbred animals through continuously inbred lines but as a whole i think the whole genetic population within the uk is probably one of the most healthiest in terms of the amount of genetic material available compared to other species i don't even know if i finished and making my point there i kind of went on a bit more <laughs> i get what you mean you know yeah because like um in order for a population to be sustainable there needs to be a significant number of them kept yeah so i'm thinking if we truly are if, if they truly just are pets then you could argue the fact that morphs have incentivized people to get in an appropriate amount of stock to care for this captive population of pets properly it would be an argument if we were breeding outwards, but most people breed inwards. So in order for those morphs, and it is like a genetic arms race, whoever gets there quickest often manages to get that big money. So the first banana um, in the early 2000s was like $25,000. Um, everyone wants that next hit. So if you get anything recessive, the first thing they'll do is breed um, mum to son or son to daughter and then the siblings together and then you create this line gening and then this genetic bottlenecking and then rather than 
expanding that out, they'll then add that to another gene that's had a similar thing. So you might potentially have a population of animals that we've got loads of, but there isn't that genetic integrity there anymore. It's just completely inbred into this worse and worse situation that we're not going to be able to tell until it's too late down the line. So you're saying the morphs themselves have actually incentivized um, inbreeding through people looking to take shortcuts? Yeah, it's all about who can get there the fastest because if you think like from $25,000 to is what 10 years later you can get a banana for about 80 pounds like that is a massive dive in money so the you know in order to properly get a female up to size you're looking at three years people don't take three years they'll power feed it and then as soon as she's ready she'll put it straight back to the um the male that they've got there which is the dad and you just start really quickly losing um your genetic diversity because you're just cousins cousins sisters brothers i suppose a counter argument to that is that is that necessarily the morph's fault or is that the greed of the individual i suppose you could argue that the ethics and the way someone goes about that project doesn't necessarily mean that it's the morph's fault rather than the individual. But I suppose the way the morph game goes is that if you do try to do things in that ethical, responsible way, you get left behind by the fact that it is that race. So your hands are kind of tied in that regards. But is that the fault of the actual morph itself or the culture we've created within the hobby? It's definitely a people problem. Like, you can't blame a morph for that. It's that greed and that money tag that comes alongside it. Because if we're all doing it for passion and all just for the making different looking snakes, then we wouldn't be rushing it. It's to make sure that you, when you invest your money, that you're going to get the money out before the person in the other breeding facility gets there first. I suppose a counter argument to the whole fact that we could say they're just pets, but actually in a conservation mindset, actually, because we're creating these colorful patterns and color sets in morphs, we may be actually indirectly benefiting wild species and the fact that for selectively breeding for more vivid, more colorful colors than their actual wild counterparts, um, the captive bred animals are actually more desirable sometimes. This was a point brought up by Tapley and Bride in 2011 in their paper um the fact that it may actually reduce the need of wild caught stock because people are focusing on captive breeding now that may not actually be the full case for python regis where people are actually still mining for new morphs from the wild but things like cali kings and corns in the uk no one really will import wild caught animals into the uk anymore because everyone's content breeding with captive bred morphs well you'd say that but <laughs> no. um according to my research um on the IUCN um 55 percent of um the exports of royal python still go out to America and the um they're still one of the largest CITES listed um live exports out of Africa um, and then it's even infecting the wild populations. There was, um, I can't say the name, A-U-L-I-Y-A -A -A out in um, 2020. Um, suggests Is that the author's that name, it, sorry? Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the source says that in Togo, Benign and Ghana, um, ball pythons are released largely unregulated back into the wild. Um, contributing to foreign genetic material in local subpopulations and therefore um, is negatively impacting the fitness of individuals in those populations and therefore their conservation status. And then I was also reading in crested geckos that um, we've got so many in captive populations, it's currently illegal to export any of the New Caledonian geckos and yet it's still happening. Well, it's interesting that you say about how the fact that they re-release the females um, 
I would say that's more of a logistical issue rather than the fact that it happens. I think if these animals were being re-released to where they were found, they wouldn't be having this problem. But again, if we weren't doing this though, like the whole system of collecting these gravid females, allowing them to lay their eggs, raising up the neonate regis and then exporting them and then re-releasing the females. If the morph industry wasn't doing this, then it wouldn't be providing this economic support to these rural communities in Africa. It's arguably a very sustainable practice collecting these gravid females and then doing this. The wild population, according to Lucili anyway, isn't severely affected by this practice. The, the other threat on the wild population is actually bushmeat. So it's it's a case of the sustainable practice of actually re-releasing these females and then only taking a quota of young from the country for the pet trade. All these actual adult oral pythons go to the bushmeat trade and the animal's dead. No, no function, no, not able to functionally breed ever again and you're just taking away from that population. So it's a counterbalance between if this diminishes, the economic need of these rural villages is still there. So if we stop importing, then they will rely more on the bush meat. And then how is that going to affect the wild population? It's a case of an okay situation being taken away, creating a bad situation for the population of wild royals. I think the problem is at the moment we don't know. That's the um, thing. The, even IUCN um, state that we just do not have enough data. We don't know how much even our collecting now is impacting on them, let alone we haven't got an idea of what actually sustainable looks like. And I think that in the pet trade owes the world populations to fund those studies. We can't just keep taking it out and making profit off these animals without at least going back and studying and making sure. Well, I, th I, I would agree. I would say that the thousands of dollars or pounds or whatever currency that is generated through morph production, it would only seem right that we fund studies to make sure that the wild populations aren't actually being completely diminished by this practice. But in theory so far, although not, scientifically measured in theory the practice is that this is sustainable um but also like these hunters aren't going out miles away from the villages these hunters are collecting around the vicinities of their villages so it also incentivizes them to protect these as a key resource because now you've added a commercial value to them rather than something to just hunt for the bushmeat. The other key point is the fact that the villagers also manage the landscape in a way that they create a mosaic of fields which benefits the pythons they're trying to collect but also as a byproduct it's actually benefiting a whole wide array of species. It's almost like a flagship species in conservation where everything benefits below that even though People are only focusing on that key species. So you can argue that it's actually that conservation through commercialization in this particular species example. At the moment, in theory, that appears to be the case. Luca Lucili, the guy that spent like 30 odd years in the wild researching them, the person that described them as semi-arboreal and hunting birds and did all the stomach flush studies, he himself recommends that there be a reasonable level of international trade for the pet species, for the, for the pet industry. Um, at elevated prices should be promoted over the bushmeat, etc. Otherwise, the adult royals are, will be used for skins and whatnot. If that value and demand for the pet trade isn't there as the more sustainable alternative. Well, part of the problem is that they take these animals from the wild um, and then because of the sheer amount of animals that these people are producing and to cut 
keep up with demand and spacing, they're then keeping them in these racking systems. So then they have animals that are often not tested, um, kept in these small, tight um, drawers for long periods of time all together. Um, so we're bringing in these wild specimens that are bringing diseases into these collections like NIDO, um, and then we're just sending them out into the hobby. Is that not the case for any species though? Is that necessarily in relation to morphs? Is disease screening and quarantine and prevention just a larger issue than the hobby at large rather than just being directly related to morphs? It is a large issue, but I think like when you look at these massive breeders and they're literally like wall to ceiling, just drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers, I can't imagine that every single one of those has been screened. And then when they're moving between collections um, or in, people are being encouraged to keep in this way, then it's just going to exacerbate an issue. Yeah, I mean, it, it is the nature of the morph industry to, well, it's the game, isn't it? To be the first one yeah. to, so you need large amounts of animals for these projects. So you you can see how morphs themselves are actually incentivizing to house more animals because of this. It's, yeah, it's the culture of keeping as many as you can in a single space so that you can maximize the amount of products and therefore um, projects and then therefore the amount of profit that you're able to bring back into your facility um, and then it's that's at the forefront of the decisions that are being made opposed to biosecurity or any of the other aspects of keeping them. I suppose on the flip side to that though the thousands of thousands of pounds or dollars or whatever that have been generated by this practice that have been put into the industry to actually grow the sector which actually means there's more keepers within the hobby spending more money on food equipment and housing not everyone that likes morphs actually keeps and racks so they are spending money on the, like the vivariums and its pvc enclosures um, the money is going into the industry and because more people have been brought in. This may but this may not be true for everyone that is entering projects and sees the morph animal as an investment. That may be relegated to a commercial racking system. But on a pet level, it is true. Like gene, like I said before, the genes that are a couple of hundred pounds, people are buying as pets. So it has brought in a number of people that has grown the industry, which inspires innovation to create new projects that species that aren't even containing morphs within them are benefiting from the technology that is now being developed. I think on the flip side of it, with the sudden boom of new keepers, there is the boom of impulse buying. It is common practice to be like, get one and then get another and another and another within a very short amount of time unfortunately morphs lend themselves to be collectible you can never have enough there's over 250 different morphs that you can have and that's without the combinations um, and therefore these brand new keepers are not always going into keeping them in the vivs they're going into buying them racks there's products of where you can have just five racks in like a living room setup which is encouraging this um impulse collecting and then the other side of that is suddenly we're having morphs turning up in rescue centers these are long-lived animals you know the first banana that we ever had is still around hopefully fingers crossed it was only 2003 um, so we've got all of these now, each time we've got the new morphs, the older morphs become less and less valuable. I just worry long term that we're going to have rescues sat with hundreds and hundreds of these no longer um, valuable morphs, if that makes sense. Also, the normals pop out in these um, pairings. And unfortunately, this beautiful um, animal, because it hasn't received the right genetics, they're seen as almost you can't get rid of them. They're these 20 pound snakes that just appear or um, 
they try and pop them in you have to buy them as a pair so that they can try and get rid of them so we're going to be ending up with these all these normal ball pythons that we just have a surplus supply of that no one wants anymore I think it's a shame when we've got to a point where an animal that lives for 40 years you can pick up for nothing it's just to get rid of it and it's not doing justice for being able to make sure that breeders are breeding correctly in vivariums, giving the adults UV and the correct heat and the correct time. You cannot pay £20 for that. And yet it's something that's accepted because they're so throwaway now. I can't counter that. I don't think there's nothing I can think of that I can say that counters that point. I think that requires change in the industry and i think that with the likes of um rare genetics testing which they're now working on testing um for morphs so how it works is you'll be able to send in your shed from your snake and they'll be able to tell you what morph is within it hopefully so there won't be so much of a byproduct of is it this? Is it that? Oh no, we've tried to prove it out. We've just pr- produced a load of normals as byproduct. You should be able to test and know exactly what is coming out, and that should lessen the need for proving things and the byproduct animals that creates. I don't think that necessarily excuses it. The fact that we may have the technology to not need it in the future, but I think that that may alleviate itself going forward. That's, that's a weak <laughs> argument. I think that's a very weak counter that I can make there, but I am, I am on the opposite side of what I normally think, so I'm trying, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to like um, go into it too much just because there's so much. I'm just going to go over um, just because I didn't know there was so much out there in different species. I thought... Um, so the classic one is the royal pythons, um, just to list a few that have issues with wobbles, is spot nose, um, hidden gene woma, um, obviously spider. Um, and one of the problems with spider is that there was a recent paper out, it shrank in 2022. So this year it discovered that um, we always thought it was just the colour pattern and we couldn't figure out how to link the two together but actually um, it is an internal ear structure problem and we cannot separate the two so every spider snake has um, an internal ear um, deformity basically and that means that's why they have that horrific um, wobble um, and the corkscrewing and therefore they're struggling to hunt um, is because of the two link Um, and it is a warning to all of these um, a morph is a mutation and a mutation it doesn't have to be bad but it can be and we can only the only um mutation we're seeing is the outside and we just have to think about what could be t- potentially happening on the inside um and it's the enigma gene in leopard geckos um they don't know what's causing it um but they think it is to do with the it's actually impacting the genetics and the way the proteins are made um because it's a dominant gene when an animal gets two copies it's lethal um so they're all heterozygous um and then yeah so the protein um basically gets deformed and therefore the coordination in their brain can't work and they're thinking it's similar to Huntington's disease so we're actually breeding animals with um, a brain that is malformed and therefore that is why they're doing all of these um, wandering around in circles they can't hunt properly they have death rolling um, seizures and things like that because there's actually something wrong with the um, physical makeup of their brain bless them. I think even though that I took the the pro stance I, I i can't think i can't think of any way to d- defend the likes of the spider gene or the silk backs or anything like enigma if it's something proven time and time again to be so 
damaging to health and welfare. I can't really see any way to defend it. No. Like, I know some people can say, oh, it's only, you can, like, some have only a little wobble. You're breeding in deformity. Like, at what point do we say that that's gone too far? Yeah. I think we're so far removing ourselves from thinking about what is important in a function. So a snake not being able to tell what's up and what's down, not being able to strike properly, and therefore not being able to climb in an enclosure properly. But people are still sat there arguing, but the snake doesn't know any better. Why is that justifiable? I just don't understand it. And unfortunately, with the gene, you could have a beautiful um, adult. They only have a slight little wobble in their head. Um, and then you go on to produce um, babies from them and they could have the most horrific corkscrews. The, there's just no way of being able to um, predict exactly how much the offspring are going to suffer because you've decided to pair them. And I think they have tried to um, selectively pick the spiders that haven't got the wobble and they just haven't been able to separate it. And I think at some point you've got to accept that it's not acceptable anymore and just let it go. But I think, unfortunately, there is that money aspect to it. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I, that is a hill I'm prepared to die on. I just think of all the morphs available of the like spider just just let spider die just let the gene die we don't need it there's alternatives that look kind of similar anyway like pinstripe looks nice like you don't need it so let it go that's why i think there's, um cinnamon for example on its own is um it's not harmful it's absolutely fine when you start pairing super cinnamon so two copies of cinnamon what can happen is that the babies get a cleft palate or they get back deformity, so they get kinking in the spine um, and they can also get pinched skulls and bulbous eyes. Um, but someone produced a super cinnamon pied called a panda pied and that hit the world with a sensation. It's like a very famous um, snake worth a lot of money. The amount of pairings that people have done to try and reproduce that, despite the amount of um, kinking, kef, like cleft palates, like it was, people are solely focused on hitting that big money again that they can't see the welfare implication of purposely pairing animals you know have a risk of deformities like that. And I think as well, we um, unfortunately with morphs, people don't pick the right reasons to breed an individual they pick because they're going to pair these two animals together because they've got this and this and this and this and this and they want to produce this but no one's thought is that animal um mature enough is it a good feeder is it a good handleable temperament is it coping in the environment and therefore i've like gone to collections and they're like breeding these animals that are stressed out they like throw themselves out the drawer every time um but we're breeding it because it has that specific gene not because it's coping i think it's a case of not every gene is in my opinion acceptable like the intentional inbreeding to take corners i personally take issue with um and I know that, like, you can argue some of these really pretty morphs can bring people into the hobby. But I also think there's a lot of equally pretty dominant morphs that you could breed and also not do all this recessive line breeding and inbreeding to, to perpetuate. I, th I think that there could be a lot more ethical choices made to lean towards these dominant morphs because like, inherently i don't think morphs are wrong i think the choices people make regarding morphs can be wrong like i see nothing wrong with like a, a leopard or something like yellow belly or something 
I take issue with things that affect the animal to such a great degree that either affects them neurologically or physically like spider. Even albinism is a dodgy one for me just because of like the fact that they have the cones in their eyes to see into the ultraviolet spectrum, which means if you want to do everything properly, and I think most people should think they want to do everything properly, then they should have UV to even see properly. But if you're producing something without the melanin in the eye, then they're hypersensitive to bright light. So you're creating this weird dynamic where the animal can't be what it is, and it has to behaviorally adapt itself to just exist if that makes sense like they have to cryptically bask in, in a way that means that their eyes aren't exposed to light and stuff um but that's not normal for what they are so i know there are a lot of pretty albino genes but it's a case of is something dominant not just as pretty but without the same wealth of implications I think there's a lot, I think it's still very much the wild, wild west. Um, and I think it has a while to go before, like, it really governed itself properly. Because I don't think there's really any govern. like, everyone's opinion is equal to each other's, and that's fine. But when opinion seems to equal welfare science in the, in the, in the sense of, Oh, I, I think spider's fine, so I'm going to carry on, whereas it's a complete decimation of welfare. I think that's the issue. Especially because um, the single gene spider being banned from breeders' meat... In the UK, that is, yeah. In the UK, was had a massive backlash, it's still... People were up in arms about it. They didn't want to listen to the reason why. Um, and like see sense of maybe that is an indication that now is the time to stop because it hasn't stopped it. They've just carried on. It just, it didn't deter anyone. Yeah, I think the, the place for morphs in the hobby is a weird one because there's definitely are benefits to morphs, but there also are there's also those major drawbacks but i don't think that means it's necessarily morphs as a whole i think it's necessarily a gene by gene basis that's what i think um i think a lot of people will argue about morphs but not a lot of people are talking about gene by gene basis i know spider everyone talks about spider but there's also a load of genes that also have wobble that no one talks about yeah and um, they've kind of just like slipped under the radar, kind of like, don't mention it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's been like kind of swept under the rug. Like, what are the other genes that have wobble um, other than spider? Um, champagne, spot nose. Um, I think that's it. Champagne and spot nose. Oh, no. Um, hidden gene woma um, and woma. But there's some that, um, like, for example, lesser, a super lesser produces animals with um, smaller eyes or there's um, um, desert as a gene. They, the females um, die trying to lay eggs. They become, um, they're either infertile and they can't get them produced to lay eggs or they can never complete the process. Mm. Um, and yet no one like bring that. I mean, that's a major welfare issue, not being able to breed as an adult. Um, and there's like other genes that cause kinkings and things like that. But everyone focuses on the spider, I think, because it is so iconic. Um, it's in the same as in why is it always royal pythons that are picked on when it comes to that? But corn snakes have neurological issues. And so do leopard geckos. And so do... Um, carpet pythons as well i think it's more of a case that this regis has taken center stage in that regards where everyone just focuses on them that the prime of everyone's thoughts when it comes to morph so you think morph you think world python or ball python so i think that's good but it's interesting i don't think morphs are in themselves an issue i think that the industry 
hasn't weeded out the morphs that are issues, like you said about like the wobble and ch- is the wobble and champagne etc. Lesser than it is in Spider. Is Spider an extreme case of the wobble? Well, I the I've never met um, a champagne or a spot nose that had a significant wobble. They've always had like maybe a little bit of a head trimmer that you can see, but um, people do claim that there are cases where they are just as bad as the spiders with the major cork. But I think the problem with um, the spider one is that they can't line breed it out. Whereas as I think with the champagne and the spot nose, it depends what line of genetics you're getting it from. So some of them you can definitely, you wouldn't be able to tell. So I think for those ones, there's hope of potentially like line breeding it into just a place where it isn't a problem. Morphs are natural. It's just a part of having genetic variation within a population. And there will always be things that pop out that look different. And I don't think it's a bad thing to keep the different. I just think, yeah, you have to think about the ethics of it and where all of the babies end up going. If you're going to produce a clutch, you have to think about is there a demand for what you're breeding and um, long term what's going to happen to them? I think there should be some um, accountability for all of these throwaway animals that no one wants anymore. I think probably the answer to the question is, is it good or bad, is probably it's both. It's not necessarily yeah. the morphs that are good or bad. It's the decisions of the people working with them that have made good or bad decisions.